Well, I think it's probably time to call this gathering to order. Uh, thank you all for joining us here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our two featured experts today, Rich Armitage and Kurt Campbell, friends both, who will uh, take us through the key issues featured in their just released chairman statement and in the Atlantic Council's report, The Future of U.S. Extended Deterrence in Asia to 2025. Now, this report is a product of an independent and bipartisan Atlantic Council task force convened by the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security to conduct analysis and make actionable recommendations regarding the challenges and opportunities to strengthen U.S. extended deterrence in East Asia over the coming decade. Co-chaired by Secretary Armitage and Dr. Campbell, the task force was comprised of former senior U.S. government officials and observers, both from the Department of Defense and Department of State, as well as academic and think tank experts. The task force also engaged with thought leaders in East Asia to assess their perceptions of U.S. security guarantees. Special thanks right off the top to the generosity of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States, and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for sponsoring this project. And thank you as well to our partners, the Japan Institute of International Affairs and the Asan Institute. Now, this discussion could not come at a more important time. The Asia Pacific has become the focal point of U.S. strategy and defense policy following the release of the Obama administration's defense guidance in January 2012. The administration's decision to rebalance to Asia has prompted a great deal of reflection on what this means for U.S. relationships with both allies and adversaries in the region and around the world. As the first U.S. administration since the advent of the nuclear era to declare the goal of eliminating nuclear weapons, the Obama administration must address how to advance these goals without undermining the perceived or actual credibility of America's regional nuclear umbrella. The administration's nuclear disarmament and arms control policies will have major implications for countries that rely on the U.S. nuclear umbrella, including Japan and South Korea and East Asia, as well as countries that are the object of deterrence, such as North Korea and China. Meanwhile, improved and emerging technologies threaten to alter or even disrupt the strategic balance in the region, including the credibility of the U.S. presence. Increasingly sophisticated space and cyber capabilities, particularly by countries such as China and even North Korea, threaten to negate the technological advantage of U.S. weaponry or even disrupt the command and control of U.S. nuclear forces and anti-ballistic missile, missile technologies. These are the challenges the United States must confront and overcome. For that, I am delighted to have these prominent statesmen with us today to help think through these issues. Rich Armitage, currently the president of Armitage International, previously served as the deputy, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State from 2001 to 2005. He is one of the foremost experts on the Asia Pacific whose deep understanding of the region is informed by a highly successful career in public service and business. Rich has served his country in key diplomatic positions, including as presidential ne special negotiator for the Philippines military base agreement, where I first got to know Rich, and special mediator for water in the Middle East. President Bush sent him as a special emissary to Jordan's King Hussein during the 1991 Gulf War. He has also served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia Pacific Affairs in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Kurt Campbell is currently the founding partner, chairman, and CEO of the Asia Group. From 2009 to 2013, he served as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, where he is widely credited as being a key architect of the pivot to Asia. In this capacity, Dr. Campbell advanced a comprehensive U.S. strategy that took him to every corner of the Asia-Pacific region, where he was a tireless, and I would say brilliant, advocate for American interests, particularly the promotion of trade and investment. His vision and leadership were essential in the administration's efforts to strengthen security alliances and partnerships from Northeast to Southeast Asia, 
and throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Rich, Kurt, thank you both for being here today. And now it's my great privilege to turn this program over to Barry Pavel, Vice President and Director of the Brent Scowcroft Center for International Security. Thank you very much, Governor Huntsman, um, for that introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, and an honor to share this stage with these distinguished uh, statesmen with so much experience who have really dug in and given us a very, uh, I think, important um, document that can help inform any discussions on the future of extended deterrence in Asia because the future is going to be different from the past and I think sort of capturing the changes that are ongoing and getting ahead of those is, is absolutely critical. So I think without further ado, we will hear from each of our distinguished panelists, first from Dr. Campbell, then from Secretary Armitage. I may ask them a few questions and then we'll open it up for discussion. So I think with that, I would love yes. to pass it to Dr. Campbell. Thank you, Barry, and welcome to everyone this afternoon. I just want to take a moment uh, to say thank you to the Atlantic Council for convening this group and bringing us together. We had a great task force. We met for uh, the better part of six months. We explored every matter associated with uh, challenges to deterrence and the American position in the Asia Pacific region. I want to particularly thank Barry and uh, our, our leader behind the scenes. He led from behind in every possible way, Bob Manning, uh, for helping us uh, to uh, both, first of all, conceive the project and then uh, launch it effectively. Also can't uh, tell you, I hope you all have the opportunity at some point to have the chance to work closely uh, with Rich Armitage. He is the godfather of our Asia Pacific strategies, worked uh, tirelessly, as uh, Ambassador Huntsman said, for uh, decades to learn uh, working with him is a true honor. And a particular thanks to Ambassador Huntsman, who was a great ambassador uh, to China, uh, a wonderful public figure, and we appreciate his role at the Atlantic Council and supporting this overall effort. Let me just say, I, I think the ambassador has uh, framed it very effectively, but I want to put it in a larger context if I can. Um, it's terrific to see a good turnout, particularly given how much news there is elsewhere on the international stage. And the truth is, despite uh, just enormous challenges in Ukraine and Eastern Europe and in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and the Middle East going forward, uh, it is undeniable that the lion's share of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in the Asia Pacific region. And the United States wants to play a major role in that history as it proceeds. Uh, part of that is making sure that we have the wit and wisdom to remain uh, fundamentally engaged as we have been in the past going forward. But I think one of the issues uh, that we were all in agreement uh, uh, on is though the United States has a very strong foundation uh, in the Asia Pacific region, what used to suffice no longer does. We need to step up our game comprehensively, step up our diplomacy. We need to have a comprehensive strategy that integrates every aspect of the Asia Pacific uh, region, engagement with China, strong work with our allies, bringing new partners like India and Europe into the region to ensure that we're working on issues such as the rebalancing of our military engagement. Most importantly, the support for our trade and engagement uh, strategy uh, uh, commercially, uh, and also uh, working to build multilateral uh, capacity going forward. I think we all recognize that our ticket to the big game in Asia has been our military uh, capabilities uh, now over decades that have seen challenges uh, during the Vietnam War at the end of the Cold War. But that sustaining presence has given us remarkable capacity in the Asia Pacific region. I do not typically like European analogies as they're applied uh, to Asia. Almost always when Asian friends hear a European analogy, they immediately turn off and think this is a person who doesn't understand Asia. So they're trying to apply wisdom from elsewhere to a very different uh, uh, set of sp uh, specifics. However, I'm going to use one here because I think it's <laughs> particularly apt. In the 1980s, uh, uh, Secretary uh, of, the, uh, uh, of NATO uh, was appointed by uh, 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 the uh, Prime Minister uh, Thatcher in Britain 
Uh, and he uh, listened uh, in 1983 during a particularly difficult set of interactions among the French and the Italians and others, and they were complaining about the Americans as being difficult to work with, impossible. They don't listen, they don't coordinate, they go off on their own. And he listened for you know about 45 minutes to pretty substantial complaints about the United States. And at the end of this he said, ah, alas, they are the only Americans we have. And in many respects, that is the role that the United States has played in Asia for decades. But undergirding that effective American strategy has been a, uh, a seamless web of statements, doctrinal commitments, military uh, innovations, troop presence, and also response to challenges that has at its core uh, underscored the American uh, determination uh, to maintain uh, peace and stability. And as part of that is a strong deterrent uh, quality, both conventionally and, if necessary, with the nuclear umbrella. Uh, over the course of decades, uh, some have questioned that. And uh, through high-level uh, commitments, through uh, specific steps uh, in terms of our own deployments, we've tried to support our commitments going forward. I think what Rich and I uh, came to uh, see uh, with the strong support of Barry and Bob was that there were a number of steps that are taking place, many that Ambassador Huntsman has already described, that are threatening. Uh, uh, the American forward presence, calling into question our capabilities, new military innovations, capabilities that go at our forward deployed uh, uh, presence, uh, and provocations from North Korea that raise concerns across Northeast Asia more generally. And what this report has attempted to do is to lay out very specifically an integrated set of strategies, diplomacy, high-level consultations and working groups with our allies, clear-eyed clear, uh, clear -eyed, uh, engagements with Chinese friends, attempts to communicate directly with North Korea uh, where our particular interests lie and what North Korea should avoid, uh, and uh, specific military and security steps in terms of investments in new capabilities and deployments going forward. I think what you will find here, both in Bob's longer study and also in our executive assessment, are some, what we hope, clear-eyed recommendations on the way forward that we believe will help support an enduring, ongoing commitment of the United States to the peace and prosperity of the Asia Pacific into the 21st century. Thank you. Rich. When you have a podium, you ought to take advantage of it, I figure. Uh, <laughs> John, it's quite a thrill to be introduced by you, and I thank you for it, Barry. Good to be with you. Bob, thanks for shepherding this through, and I'd have to note with some enthusiasm that Harlan Ullman's in the audience, so there must be something going on in Asia that brings Harlan out. Uh, nice to see you. You know, there are a lot of reasons why people who you'll see listed as task force members took part in this endeavor. Uh, some of us were there because uh, we recognize that uh, any administration, to some extent, uh, uh, plays foreign policy like five-year-old kids play soccer. They all run to the ball, and the ball right now is primarily in the Middle East, and we were fearful that people would overlook uh, our equities uh, in Asia. Others of us in the task force were worried about uh, the rebalancing, uh, which, uh, as a reflection of our strategic interest, is in my view, fantastic and right on, but the manner in which it's thus far been carried out is somewhat lacking, and we wanted to give some impetus to that. Others were somewhat motivated by a speech that was given in Shanghai by Xi Jinping at the opening of the Chika Conference, the Conference on Interaction and Competence Building uh, Measures in Asia. Uh, and in short, what President Xi said was, uh, oh, by the way, Asia is for Asians. That doesn't seem to leave much room for Americans. And this uh, bothered some of us. It bothered me uh, quite a bit. Uh, others are uh, wondering uh, what China means when they say, oh, Asia's big enough for both of us. Uh, that's a true statement as far as I'm concerned. But if what China means by that is Asia's OK for the United States, Guam East, and from Guam West, it's OK for China, that's a different question. Uh, there's the question of the uh, acceptance by the present administration of the Chinese formulation of a new relation, new type of relationships between great powers. We've accepted it. 
It might be fine, but it's never been defined. And when it's not defined, it opens questions. And it's open questions, I think, in the minds of our, some of our Asian friends and allies. And the backdrop to all of this is the uh, gray areas, which many of us have talked about, of coercion and provo provocation. So, uh, as I say, or tailored coercion, as our colleague Pat Cronin would say. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, several of us took part uh, in this endeavor. And uh, it is left to me, as Kurt indicated, uh, to uh, one cleanup, which is a joke. Uh, Kurt and I have been friends for 20 years, and uh, the good news about U.S. or Republican and Democratic approach to Asia is you can tell the difference generally from one administration to the next because we have the same views. And in addition, we happen to be close friends. Well, with the first recommendation of the seven that we put forward in the chairman's report is to clarify the U.S. strategic doctrine. The Obama administration came into office saying that they wanted to eventually, over the long term, go to zero nuclear weapons. I didn't personally think that was a good idea, but it, it's a point of view you could have. But you can imagine that this opened up some questions in the region for people who defend on, depend on the uh, nuclear umbrella. Now, I believe the administration has well corrected that and they had a nuclear posture review in 2010 and made it very clear that the U.S. will maintain a credible nuclear deterrent so that risks outweigh benefits to a potential adversary. The second uh, recommendation that we have is we really want to enhance the strategic dialogue with allies and friends. Now, that sounds like something we do every day. Well, not always. We've been without an assistant secretary in the Pentagon until recently, and we now have Dave Shear there, and I think he'll do a terrific job for us uh, in the Pentagon, uh, really putting some oomph and some energy into these extended deterrence dialogues. At least that's the hope. But what we had in mind, beyond talking about the obvious nuclear and conventional uh, forces and postures of the United States, we want to broaden and extend that uh, dialogue to cyber and to space, uh, to BMD, and frankly, to contingency planning where it's acceptable to uh, our interlocutors. The third recommendation was we really want to upgrade and update the U.S.-Japan alliance. With what the Abe administration has brought about with the National Security Council and the, uh, the cabinet decision on uh, collective self-defense and the ability now to export defense technology to third countries, it's opened up a brand new realm. We are now trying to do, for the first time in 17 years, update the guidelines for defense cooperation. And in many of our views, it's no longer sufficient to just talk about contingency planning for today's issues. We're going to have real defense planning where we take a look at what we think the future is going to be and talk about the type of enhancements to our military posture and to our capabilities that we might need. And it's undeniable, it seems to me, that with the decision of the Abe government to open up uh, to third country transfers of defense technology, that this opens up all kinds of rich vista for the United States and for Japan to cooperate together. And any potential adversary should have to think twice when you see the two most technologically advanced countries in the world cooperating together to solve common problems. Uh, the fourth uh, recommendation is we need to seek a comprehensive strategic to seek comprehensive strategic stability with China. It has to be very clear, this, we do not have a good relationship right now with China. Eight successive presidents, to include this one, going all the way back to Richard Nixon, have desired a stable relationship. We've cooperated, each of those presidents has cooperated where possible and has competed where necessary. And we have to, if we're going to have this type of dialogue with China, we have to realize that there is mutual distrust it is not just questions in the U.S. about China's motives. There are real questions in China's mind about our motives and their, their own view of whether uh, rebalancing was directed against them, uh, whether TPP, for instance, is uh, really directed in some way against China. And we need to really work hard at a high enough level to make sure we have that type of strategic stability in our engagement with China. We don't have to agree, but it seems to me we've got to do the best we can to remove the the distrust on both sides. Fifth is we feel very strongly that we need to protect the U.S. conventional shift to Asia. Both Secretary Panetta 
and Secretary Hagel more recently at Shangri-La have said that by 2020, we want to have 20%, excuse me, 60% of our uh, naval assets in the Pacific. The fact of the matter is we are far, far short of that right now. If you look carefully, you may see that only about 30 to 35% of our assets are in the Pacific. The reason is quite obvious, ISIS in the Middle East. And at some point in time, we are truly going to have to pivot and move those forces out because to have said that we're going to have 60% by 2020 and not to do it is not going to be a good thing for our own credibility. Six, uh, we have come up, uh, the, the task force, with a view that the administration engaged as they are in very difficult and weighty issues still has to have the wherewithal and the desire to invest heavily into R&D, at least $300 million a year. This is something that can quickly be forgotten in a time of trauma, as we're now uh, feeling uh, in the Middle East. And there are systems out there that can be absolutely essential to us. Electronic lasers, uh, new generation electronic warfare systems, things of that nature. And again, I go back to the recommendation on Japan. Their technology and our technology together ought to make this a very doable thing and save us both some cash. And finally, our seventh recommendation is that we need to underscore the essential economic and energy aspects of U.S. engagement and deterrence. And I'm specifically here referring to TPP. It is understandable that countries who negotiate in completely good faith with the United States are going to keep their whole cards right there until they're sure we're going to get TPA. And I think if they were sure we were going to get Trade Promotion Authority, there'd be a lot more rapid uh, completion of these negotiations for TPP. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, for us in the Pacific, TPP is the Yale game. It's the big one. It really, really matters. And likewise, energy. For 40 years now, we've had a policy in the United States about no export of energy, except from Alaska. But the lower 48 was not allowed to, uh, to export. We've just now had a recent export of uh, gas from Alaska's uh, North Slope uh, to Korea, the first time in 10 years. Just think how dramatically our own uh, position in Asia, as well as the confidence of our Asian friends, I'm speaking particularly of Korea, Japan, Taiwan, for that matter, if they had a much more dependable supply of gas from the United States. So uh, both the economic engagement and the energy engagement, given our shale revolution, uh, is something that we are really, really keen on. So with that, I will hush up. I'm delighted to be with all of you, and particularly with my friend Kurt Campbell, and we'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both our speakers. I wanted to ask a couple of questions, and then we'll uh, turn it over to broader uh, discussion. First, of Dr. Campbell, I think this, uh, the statement did a very good job of looking back a bit and also capturing China's present challenges to uh, deterrence and the U.S. Uh, network of alliances. What, what do you think are the specific key challenges going forward? I mean, the, the, the effort looks towards the future of extended deterrence. And so what do you think the, the, there's a lot of excellent substantive specific things called out in the chairman's statement, mm -hmm. but what do you think are the key, key ones in particular going forward? Thank you very much. And I just want to support uh, the way Rich laid out the recommend, uh, recommendations. I would say running through our entire effort and uh, the whole report is a deep recognition that at some level, how you uh, project uh, uh, capabilities and credibility is as much about perception as anything else. And one of the things that we face is a set of circumstances where there are questions and have been about American leadership. And that is not unique to this period. We've seen it in a number of circumstances. I would say the most important ingredient in um, ensuring that we have a strong position in Asia going forward has as much to do with American domestic performance now as any other period in our future, in our past. And I would say that one of the things that we've seen at almost a recurring level uh, over decades has been questions about American staying power. The number of times that people have thought that we're down and out, we're on the mat, and we're going to be dragged out by our heels, uh, too many times to count. I will say 
that people who have bet against the United States has, have lost an enormous amount of money over time, and that there are often uh, elements of uh, hidden strengths in the United States, both in terms of economic performance and very clear strengths associ associated with our system that I think will uh, be enduring going forward. But I think in this particular period, when there are more questions about the durability of our commitments in Asia, uh, reasserting those will be extremely valuable. And I will say one of the things that I'm glad to do this with a Republican is that sometimes the deepest debates that currently exist are not between the parties, but inside them. And so it's gonna actually take commitments and alliances between uh, internationalist Democrats and Republicans to assert enduring capabilities going forward. But to your specific question, uh, uh, Barry, I think we're dealing with a set of circumstances that more and more capabilities are being developed that basically go at the heart of American strategy. And the heart of American strategy really is how we forward deploy from a very small number of uh, uh, bases and institutions in Northeast Asia. And we believe that one of the most important things that we can do is to continue that process of diversification and investment in countermeasures going forward. Now, many people believe that aircraft carriers are hopelessly uh, uh, antiquated. I think we have some confidence in the capabilities of the US Navy and the ability to innovate, but over time, we're going to need to understand that those challenges of precision munitions, anti-axis capabilities are real and they are growing, and that the United States needs a national investment, and also along the lines that Rich indicated, closer partnership with friends and allies to create a capacity that not only anticipates these challenges, but a deterrent quality um, to those relationships going forward. Thanks very much, Kurt. Secretary Armitage, I had a, two questions for you, one traditional and one um, focused on your last recommendation, which I, I found fascinating, but the traditional one, you, one of the recommendations is to um, uh, pursue a comprehensive dialogue with, with China on strategic stability. And heretofore, many administrations have, have tried to pursue any dialogue on any aspects of strategic stability with China and not really succeeded too much. Is there a, is there a hope here? Is there a prospect for a framework? Or is this just something we just need to keep going at in the same way? I would take some. Uh uh, question with your the way you phrase the question. As I said, eight presidents have wanted to dialogue with China, and they've done it. We've not had a war. Uh, we're working on something that's pretty much unknown in history to have a country this size rising. It's every bit as important as the rise of United Germany was in the 19th century, and perhaps rivals the rise of the United States in the 20th. So. Uh, and we ought to realize that there, there are uh, going to be big differences of opinion, and that's normal, and it's understandable. But I think when I look at my own involvement with dialogue with China, the most successful we've been is when we're completely honest, maybe diplomatic, but honest about what our differences are. And there are sometimes, in some quarters of our government, Republican or Democratic administrations, their desire, there is a desire to either tell people what they want to know or, or, not be, uh, or, or not be very clear about our own intentions, our own feelings in the name of diplomacy. So I think we've been more successful in, in this dialogue, and it, just, it has to be continued in your second Question. Second question was the last recommendation on economic and energy aspects of U.S. engagement and, and deterrence. This is very non-traditional. Um, I, I personally find it extremely interesting, and, and there's clearly a, a big work agenda ahead on how do we do a better job of, of folding in economic power and our newfound and increasing energy power into our deterrence and our network of alliances and partnerships, and I would certainly open this up to Dr. Campbell as well, but I'm really interested in this, and I think this is a really provocative new agenda item that both of you have laid out on the table here. Well, on the, on the economic power aspect of this, there is a relationship between energy and economics, obviously, but on the economic side, um, I think the first thing we need to do as a people is to take stock of where we are. I don't think most of our citizens have realized how far we've come in the past several years out of a real recession. And it's about time, in my view, for the eagle to start flying a little higher with a little more confidence. And if that happens, 
then I think we might have enough confidence to actually engage in meaningful trade discussions. The energy side, uh, uh, Joe Nye and I, Dr. Nye and I have uh, co-authored three different U.S.-Japan studies, and then the, the last one we really concentrated on energy. It was our feeling that a, a Japan, in this case, and for that matter, a Korea or a Taiwan, uh, who is confident of a decent and dependable and regular supply of energy will, and it will be cheaper for them, by the way, if it's our, our gas, it'd be probably $4 uh, cheaper uh, per unit. Um, they will have the confidence to not only engage in us and have the faith in us uh, to have good discussions and close discussions, but it opens up alternatives for them in everything from their force planning, uh, whether it's blue water navy or air, et cetera, uh, to the direction of their uh, future energy needs and the future technology to uh, preserve and project uh, or protect energy. So. Uh, I think, and I was pretty ashamed, frankly, for the first two Nye Armitage reports that we didn't take into consideration uh, energy. It was so obvious to us when we finally got around to talking. So, a little bit of self admission. Um, I, I'd like to uh, particularly thank Rich and, and Bob Manning for really pressing us to get out of sort of a traditional responding with, with only specific military capabilities, a recognition that, that really uh, American presence, prestige, and engagement rests on a much more comprehensive assessment of American power and strategy. And I hope this report reflects that going forward. I do want to say just a word about the U.S.-China relationship. I, I've worked a little bit on that. Ambassador Huntsman has as well. I personally actually have quite a lot of confidence in the ability of the United States to work through problems together. And I think this is a matter of time and energy and focusing on the right agenda items as much as anything else. And I would say that in the past, Rich talked about this um, attempt to establish uh, a new great power relationship, and that was preceded by a constructive strategic partnership and the like. I, I don't have any you know, necessary um, problems with those overall approaches, but I would say it is often the case that those uh, frameworks create more questions than reassurance, both in each capital mm -hmm. and, as importantly, among the surrounding uh, neighbors and friends. My own personal experience, and I'd very much at some point like to hear Ambassador Huntsman on, on this, I think the most important agenda task before the United States and China in the current environment is to actually work together constructively on concrete cooperation. And it's, it, it, we've spent too much time on these um, ephemeral concepts and not nearly enough time on the concrete work of building habits of cooperation in military arenas across the board in our aid and our diplomatic assistance. I will tell you, I, I worked very hard with Chinese friends over five or six years and previously to that in the Pentagon. There is a remarkable amount of hesitation in being seen to work with the United States. Some of that is bureaucratic issues, some of it's distrust. I completely agree with what Rich said. The level of distrust is extremely high in China about the United States. That has to be overcome. But it is also more fundamental, I think. And one of the things that has to be apparent in the American strategy is a set of very clear, determined efforts to actually build this cooperation and make it difficult to have that be blunted or ignored or pushed aside. Just a follow up to that last point, which I think is very important. One of the variables that seems to be changing is President Xi seems to be consolidating power rather quickly in, in terms of the, how long he's been in his positions. As that continues to happen, do you see the chances for us engaging and, and, lo and interlocking China in this sort of uh, set of frameworks? Mm -hmm. Do you see that increasing Great. potentially? It, or? It's a great question. I, I'd also want to hear what Rich has to say. I would say, honestly, to be very honest, anyone who tells you a certain answer on this uh, doesn't know what they're talking about. I think in fundamental level, the jury is still out. And we are at a very early period of trying to understand how to work with President Xi and his administration. We know a few things. 
One is comprehensively, um, we are no longer working fundamentally with a, um, uh, with a combined group leadership. We're dealing with uh, a man, a leader who's consolidated power more rapidly and in his own hands uh, probably than any other leader in China's uh, recent history. Uh, number one. Number two, as importantly, he has brought decision making on foreign policy and national security very close to him. And so many of the interlocutors that we normally deal with are sometimes outside of the sphere and circle of, uh, of, of advice and engagement. And so, and, and they have taken steps to make it difficult to penetrate and understand this circle of advisors around him in Chung Wan Hai. That is the second. Third, it does appear that his fundamental goals uh, to date have to do with domestic performance. He's involved in an absolutely profound set of challenges domestically that are basically about trying to create a new model of growth to replace the one that China has followed for the last 30 years, which is essentially about export-led growth. And that is a very difficult siren song uh, to resist. And I think one of the things that we're going to see in the coming weeks is this battle inside the Chinese government between those that are arguing that we need an immediate stimulus because of concerns about uh, flagging growth and those that are saying, no, no, this is going to be painful, but we must stay the course on reform. That is a very fierce debate that is playing out, and that is his primary focus. The question then is, in that environment, how do issues associated with engagement with Japan, with issues related to um, the South China Seas, with the East Seas, how do those animate the strategic perceptions in China? My own personal sense is we're seeing a China that is more assertive, more determined, probably more nationalistic. And I think what that means for the United States, as uh, Ambassador Armitage indicates, we have to be very clear and very determined in our effort, not only to convey our strong desire to have a good relationship with China, but be clear about areas that we're prepared to work together, which are many, numerous, sustaining the operating system of Asia that has been so good to all of us in the last 30 years. But be clear where certain actions risk um, threatening the peace and stability that have been so valuable uh, to China over the course of these last 30 years. I, I, as Kurt, I don't know what the future brings for China. I've got a suspicion. I often think, uh, well, or sometimes think, when President Obama gets up in the morning, he must just shake his head at the enormity of the problems that face him, whether it's in the Middle East or whether it's through the a recalcitrant uh, Congress, uh, it's getting no credit for economic revival, a lot of things. But I'll tell you, the one who gets up in the morning and really, really has problems is Xi Jinping, because he's dealing with a huge, unprecedented number of problems at the same time, not ad seriatum. At the end of the day, my own view, and completely agree with a more assertive, more nationalistic China, I think ultimately China is going to make their way through their economic goals. I kind of think they're like Lehman Brothers. They're too big to fail. And any of us who want them to fail is nuts. Because the last thing we need is a fractious, a, a fractious bumptious China. Uh, so I think they'll perhaps stumble through for a while on some economic doldrums, but eventually they get to the other side. And for us, as we appear to be on the economic ascendancy, this ought to create some incentives, if we put them forward correctly, to have cooperation or China, which is going to need to have a little more uh, wind in their sails economically, I think. Uh, but that uh, will be for the next administration, I'm afraid. Great. Well, thanks very much. Now we'll open it up to questions from any of you. Um, yes, this gentleman over here in the middle. And please identify yourself and your affiliation. Very. My her. ears are stopped up from a cold, so you uh, have to repeat it. Uh, my name is Dan Caldwell from Pepperdine University in Los Angeles. Oh, great. <laughs> and uh, uh, Kurt, we don't need a, a European analogy for this, like Putin going into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. If we think about 1989 and the uh, Chinese policy in Tiananmen and apply that today to um, democratic movements in Hong Kong, what should the United States policy be toward the democracy movement in Hong Kong? And, what sort of effect do you think it'll have on U.S.-Chinese relations? It's a great question. I, I think Rich should want to answer it as well, but let me just give you my own sense. Um, one of the things that was, and thank you for the question, I appreciate your work. 
Um, one of the things that always surprised me uh, in government is, you know, you'd give a long speech on a variety of issues, and the next day, if you were demarched from friends uh, in Beijing, more likely uh, than not, it would be on a passing reference associated with Hong Kong. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it was often uh, first and foremost um, in the thinking of interlocutors in the foreign ministry and others. And I think it does suggest a couple of things, both the sensitivity with which Chinese friends view developments in Hong Kong, but also I think something that was that's been discussed more lately. I have been surprised in some of the interactions I had when I was in government at how much uh, even the most wise and internationalist interlocutor, um, uh, how much they believed that the United States was often behind uh, democratic uh, student movements, democracy groups. And of course, there are some nonprofits and other issues, but basically what is happening, as you know, in Hong Kong is indigenous largely and has caught many uh, groups and individuals off guard. I think uh, China understands the stakes here, recognizes that probably no place is watching this more closely than friends in Taiwan and understands that if, uh, uh, if things are handled in a way that creates larger uh, uh, concerns, it makes it difficult to implement the kind of far-reaching far uh, engagements that they uh, uh, hope for and, and are planning on with regard uh, to Taiwan. My own uh, personal view is that the United States should speak clearly about our values and our recognition that um, the process in Hong Kong was laid out quite clearly before the handover. And our expectations is for a process of a form of universal suffrage to take place over time. Um, I think we have to recognize quite clearly that we have some limited um, uh, 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 tools involved. And most of it is the bully pulpit and uh, quite clear engagement with some people on the ground. But it must be done in a respectful way. We have to recognize uh, that in many respects this is a window into China as well as it is a window for the uh, outside world. I, I have to say that uh, I'd like to see the United States speaking out a little bit more on this going forward. I think it would be important and I think it would help signal that we too have a strong interest in this process being handled peacefully. It, this is a pet rock of mine, so forgive me, because you did mention Ukraine, and I'm going to say something, then I'll get to Hong Kong. Uh, in 1989, when we started our activities with Ukraine, from then till now, Democrat and Republicans, EU, all have been guilty. We've been guilty of pouring tons of money into Ukraine, realizing that we were only feeding a kleptocracy, and never demanding adherence to international norms and values. That is a correct statement. There's no, when we saw those young people in Maiden, primarily young people in Maiden Square, it wasn't just a scream against Mr. Yanukovych. It was a scream against the entire political elite of Ukraine. And it is interesting to note that Yanukovych's government, as rotten as it may have been, was also democratically elected. So the specter there was of the United States actively working to unseat a democratically elected government, as rotten as it was. Hong Kong, as Kurt said, is, is quite a, a bit different. I'm actually, I've been a little surprised uh, that China has, who has such huge equities in this, has been as patient thus far as they've been in letting Hong Kong authorities handle it. Um, I think to some extent, uh, friends in China will be a little bit more careful about what they promise and say publicly, as uh, they indicated by 2017, the people of Hong Kong would have the ability to choose their own leaders. Well, that's not really what China meant. And, uh, under certain circumstances, they could, they could choose their own leaders. From my view, and the best way to go forward, and it may be, maybe it's not different from what Kurt said, I believe that the United States should stand as a paragon of human rights, human values. I also believe that we often fall short in our own country. And the best thing that we can do for the world is to make sure that we are what we say, as well as we do what we say. So we can speak up about Hong Kong. We can speak up about anything. We have a view. 
but we ought to speak up in a way that makes it clear. We have our views about human values and human rights. There are other arguments to listen to. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yes, here in the front. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Vishawat Israfakti. I'm the ambassador of Thailand in Washington, and That's it's right. been a great pleasure to hear both of you who have been uh, key proponents and architects of, of U.S. policy towards Asia. Uh, much mention has been mentioned about the, the pivot, the rebalancing towards Asia, and um, I wanted to see um, how pleased you are with, with the progress that such uh, policy has made, because we, we find that uh, it's been several years now since the policy was announced. Uh, you still find people asking whether the policy is real sometimes, and sometimes you find the administration um, uh, backing up by saying how many trips the president and the secretary of state and the secretary of defense has, has made to the region. So whether there are other parts to that which you feel that more could be done, and a second follow-up is um, you, Secretary Armitage mentioned about the, the force allocation to Asia, that it's still uh, not up to the level that is expected. But uh, are there other dimensions also to the rebalancing um, other than and defense only? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And we'll have a chance to follow these discussions up later. Um, on the rebalancing, like the, the idea was, I think, deeply held by the administration. It's the idea of, of rebalancing to Asia, uh, and it's uh, completely and totally reflective of our interests in Asia, uh, whether it's Northeast Asia or Southeast Asia. And part of the rebalancing was also rebalancing from almost a total focus to Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia. Having said that it was a genuine, real desire of the administration, my personal view is it has not been done completely. We made announcements about X-band radars. We made some announcements about Marines in Darwin. They're not going to keep PLA military planners up at night, I can tell you that. Uh, but we seem for a time to neglect the economic aspects. We got TPP going eventually, which is excellent. Uh, exchanges, no. Uh, foreign direct investment, not really. Uh, all of the things that I think Kurt, who's the real godfather uh, of, of this rebalancing, wanted. But from the State Department, I don't think you have the ability to run all the organs of this government which are needed, or the whole of government, as people say, yeah. to bring all our tools to bear at the same time. And I, I personally think that's a shame. And that's why the reasons we've, we're so keen on on force numbers, because having said that, at least we have to do that while the other elements of our bureaucracy catch up, hopefully. Thank you. I, I like Rich's answer a lot. There's not much I can add, and I thank you for the question, Ambassador. But I, w I will say a couple of things. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about Europe. Margaret Thatcher, uh, when she made the decision, unpopular in her government, that she was going to go to war in the Falklands at a time that they were completely ill-prepared and had very little in terms of resources, and it was you know a million miles away from their perspective. She gave a speech on, at that time, national TV on the telly, and kind of remember, I remember I was a student in Oxford, and she said something that I always think about, and I think about it with respect to the State Department. She said, look, we don't have all the resources, so we must summon our native cunning <laughs> and we must find a way to motivate. And that's basically what the State Department's all about. You don't have the resource, you don't have the capabilities, and so you've really got to summon your native coming. And I have to say that ultimately this has to be, and I believe it has begun, this has to be a whole of government effort. And it has to be recognized as such. I, I, the language, the perceptions today compared with four years ago are night and day much more understanding, much more commitment. Everyone is saying to you, yes, look at all these visits. Those are positive steps. And the fact that they're trying to reassure, I think, is important. I I'm going to look for a couple of things going forward. And I'll just give you my list, if I could. I like riches very much. TPP is essential. But in addition to that, I think we have to also indicate for those nations that aspire to want to work with us economically, but aren't quite yet ready, we've got to make clear that we want a closer economic relationship. That would be number one. Number two, I think 
it is normally the case, the usual playbook is when the president goes to Asia, he gives a speech to Asians about the importance of Asia. What I would like to see is a president give a speech in the United States to the American people about why Asia yeah, yeah. is important, right? And so what I actually think is the most important sell job is not externally in Asia, but in the United States. And I will tell you, if you look at the number of speeches and statements and the time and focus that is spent on the Middle East and South Asia, which is important, we're not arguing to walk away from those commitments. In fact, if we did so, we would undermine the credibility that we need to, to, to operate effectively in Asia. But we must find the time and attention to enunciate our values and our approach to Asia as a whole to the American people. And if you look at that documents and the number of speeches on the Middle East and the challenges of Afghanistan and Iraq, they, they're you know, a, a giant you know, uh, uh, stack compared to almost nothing about the importance of American comprehensive engagement in Asia going forward. For me, that is the most important articulation that the United States will need to do over the course of the next five to 10 years. And this is not one administration, it is several. My own personal view is that the great ship of state of the United States has shifted and that, and that this is now a reality. Many things uh, appearing beneath the surface that will not become as readily apparent over time, but I think will in retrospect, in retrospect be seen more clearly. At the core of this, though, I also would say I'd like to see more in Southeast Asia. I, just, Ambassador, you mentioned uh, the, the trips by Secretary of Defense, State, President. Uh, very often, Republican and Democratic administrations, when they don't have something substantive to talk about, they count trips. It's like our press does with Secretaries of State. They think odometers are equal to progress. And the number of miles traveled in, in a cylinder not equal to progress, as we've seen. Uh, more recently. But I think particularly President Obama needs to get some credit for his trips. He has attended each uh, EAS. He will be uh, in, in uh, APEC and then uh, in Burma for uh, the EAS. And I think it matters when a president travels. It is the case, I think, that most observers would say our Secretary of State now has a little difficulty in finding Asia on the map. Uh, hopefully, as we move forward, that will be rectified. I'm so sorry, but we are out of time for questions. Um, I found this to be a very provocative and engaging discussion. Please read the two documents that were produced, in particular the Chairman's statement, as well as the longer Atlanta Council report. Please join me in thanking our panelists, and please um, allow the speakers and Governor Huntsman and the Ambassador time to depart, and then uh, we can all uh, depart as well. But please join me in a round of applause first.